Our scripture reading this morning is found in 2 Peter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Okay, before we start, let's bow our heads together and let's have another word of prayer. Father, in humbleness, we pray again that your spirit may take over and may touch our hearts, everyone, according to your grace and love and wisdom. In Jesus' merits we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I, uh, I was not a good kid. I was a stupid kid. I was a kid that I did a lot of stupid stuff and people around me said that I, I was crazy and I will never change. I would cut the ends from the pen and then take rice in my hands and from the balcony of the church watch people who sleep in the church and shoot rice in their heads. <laughs> Ouch! And then I would write them on a list and give the pastor the list. Eleven people, these are the names, they slept during your sermon. And people would fall asleep and they looked to the balcony. Did Goya see me? <laughs> and I did a lot more. I could give you more stories, but I am afraid because there are kids listening and that would give them some ideas. <clears throat> and parents would go to my mom and would say, Mrs. Goya, <clears throat> Pavel did this and he did that and he put jelly jam in my shoes and he, I mean, bunch of complainings against me and my mom would lose temper and talk to my dad honey he's crazy and my dad would call me and it was not like other families the bang bang didn't follow he would call me and put me on his lap and say you did it again didn't you I said yes I did it he said I did it too <laughs> and then he would tell me what he did and that was a lot worse than me and after he told you think that he was wrong, just wait a little. After he told me what he did, he said, and you know, my father prayed for me all the time. And God changed me. And I am praying for you all the time. Because I love you. And God will change you. And let me tell you what God did for me. And then he would tell me stories of his relationship, experiences, stories. And I was like open mouth, like when you go to the dentist. Wow. And then he would say, you will have your story, because I am praying for you. So he would say, I'm not looking to what you did today. That's wrong. I'm looking to what you will become. Amen. And I praise the Lord. Amen. I felt so good. Again and again. And I looked at those pictures. And the time flew. And he would say, time is going to go quick, son. Time is going to go quick. Look at me. I was young and stupid, and now I am an adult. Tomorrow I am no longer. Time goes, so you better focus on prayer because your kids will do stupid stuff and you want to do the same for them as I did for you. Focus on prayer, focus on God, focus on kingdom, focus on service. You see how I do? Do better than me. You will do more than me. And time, he was right, time has passed. Now I have gray hair, mostly because of my wife and my kids. <laughs> Uh, she's listening. When I go home, I'm not going to eat the, the nice soup. <laughs> and I looked to my pictures when I was three years old, and then I looked to my pictures when I was 20, and I looked to my pictures when I was 40, ah, and I don't want to look to them anymore because it's something happened to me, you know. You look to those pictures, people that, like, in 1800s, those pictures that when you will do the picture, they would have a, pew, like, the light, you know, and... Everybody would, nobody smiled, by the way, it was a crime to smile. Everybody was serious, you know. What are those people now? Under the ground. Time goes quick, folks. For those who are older, it was yesterday when you were kids, and now you have grandchildren. Time goes quick, am I right or wrong? Am I right? Time flies. It was Christmas last year, and Christmas this year just went, and soon enough it's going to be Christmas again. 
time goes quick. Time goes really quick. And if you look around, if you just open your eyes, eyes Jesus is coming sooner than you think. It's not going to be long. I'm not saying that as our grandparents said. Jesus is coming so soon. That will be a surprise, a shock for everybody. He is coming, folks. Finally, he is coming. Time goes so quick. The question is, what are you doing for it? People get born. People live. People die. Other generation comes and another generation and another generation. And you know, all you see after they pass, a stone that says 1905-1980. I told you I was sick. <laughs> By the way, if you indulge me for a little fun, I will try to be quick. L reading from the internet from the tombstones. He was young, he was fair, but the engines raised his hair. Electrocuted. Here lies the body of our dead aunt Anna, cause of death by a banana. It wasn't the fruit that dealt the blow, but the skin of the thing that laid her low. Here lies Jonathan Blake, he stepped on the gas instead of the brake. Here lies Botch, we planted him raw, he was quick on the trigger but slow on the draw. <laughs> she always said her feet were killing her and nobody believed it. Born 1903, died 1942, looked up the elevator shaft to see if the car was on the way. It was. Here lies the body of Emily White, she signaled left and then turned right. Jedediah Goodwin, action year. Born 1828, going, going, gone, 1876. Stranger, tread his ground with gravity. Dentist Brown is filling his last cavity. Effie John Robinson, 1897-1922. Come, blooming youth, as you pass by, and on these lines do cast an eye. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so must you be. Prepare for death and follow me. Now, a young guy probably passed by with a permanent marker he wrote on the stone. To follow you, I'm not content. How do I know which way you went? <laughs> Here lies Lester Moore, four slugs from 44, no less, no more. Bill Blake hanged by mistake. Here lies a man named Zeke, second fastest draw in Clipper Creek. <laughs> Here lies the body of Arkansas Jim. We made the mistake, the joke was on him. Here lies the body of Margaret Bent. She kicked up her heels and the way she went. Oh, this one is a nice one. I am dead, dude. <laughs> Here lies Angelica with hair red. We realized she was on fire after she was dead. Here lies Robert Brett, who died for want of another breath. Here lies the body of Jonathan Howard, who cut off the ground instead of the power. They about in the riches, but she wore the breeches. Oh, this is a nice one. She lived with her husband 40 years and died in the hope of a better life. <laughs> Here beneath the stone we lie, back to back, my wife and I. When the angel's trump shall trill, if she gets up, I will lie still. <laughs> oh, oh. I put my wife beneath the stone for her repose and for my own. Please deactivate my Facebook. <laughs> this is the last one. Listen carefully. Once I wasn't, then I was. Now I ain't again. It sounds funny, but they are not anymore. Once I wasn't, then I was. Now I ain't again. What's going to happen to you? Regardless, if Jesus comes or if you die, What's going to happen to you? What are you focusing on? What is your purpose? What do you live for? When my father died, my mother was crying and she prayed for him and my father said, stop praying. We are not here for this life. We are transitory. We are here for heaven. And she, he said to her, I know what I have been living for. I know my Redeemer. In fact, he said, put on my stone, and she did. I know my Redeemer, and I know I shall see him. Even if my skin is destroyed, I shall see him with my eyes. Yesterday you were young, 
today old, tomorrow you are no more. You remember them? So, folks, regardless, if you have a marble stone or a regular chip stone, you are still under when you die. And you know, it doesn't matter how expensive is the stone, it doesn't matter the numbers, it doesn't matter what you write on the stone. You know what matters if you look to those stones? One thing, just one thing, look carefully. It is that little hyphen between the dates. That's what matters. That little hyphen is your, your portfolio, is what you have invested on, is what you have done in your life. That little hyphen, folks, decides your destiny forever, decides if you go up or down. That little hyphen between the two numbers decides if you will spend eternity with God or you will perish forever. Just that quick, short, passing, quick, little hyphen. And this is crazy, folks. For some reason, though that hyphen affects our eternity, we somehow focus so much on that short one second transitory quick nothing. We focus so much, we stress so much over that hyphen. Why do you stress over it? I should actually say to myself, why do I stress over it? It goes away. Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, all these things are not worthy to be compared with the glory of eternity. I count how many things, folks? What means all? I checked in Greek, you know how it's translated? All. <laughs> I consider all. That means job. That means education. That means your house, your car. By the way, since it's all not important, you can give up your cars and your homes, give them to me, I will take them. <laughs> I consider all things a loss for one single purpose, to know Christ and to be with Him. Listen, folks, to attain the resurrection, to attain the... Listen carefully, folks. Listen, unless... I want you to hear this. We are Christians. We are Seventh-day Adventists. We believe Jesus is coming soon. Unless we consider all a loss for the price of knowing Christ and spending eternity with Him. Don't spend time here. Go home, eat pizza, watch movies. You gain more. Don't spend time here in the church unless you mean what you say. Do you know the saying, when one's life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. So, my question to you is, what do you focus on? Do you focus on this hyphen or you focus on eternity? Because whatever you do during this hyphen affects eternity. Jesus is very plain, very clear. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he promises, and my God doesn't lie. All the other things will be provided. Now you know why we don't seek first the kingdom of God? It's not because we don't love God. It's because we don't trust God. It's a matter of faith. It is a matter of faith. It is a matter of faith. Because God says, I promise that if you seek me first, I promise I will take care of the other things. And because we don't trust him, we feel that we need to take care of the other things. Just taste. Have you been coming to evangelism? You remember when you had the meetings? How many remember? Many of you. I was so proud. I was so, Lord, thank you for this church. Many of you came and worked. You sacrificed four weeks, day and night, two sermons every night. You remember? Now let me ask you, did you look in your portfolio after losing four weeks for God? Did it go down? Did you lose anything? Honestly, tell me who of you lost? Hey man, I lost $10,000. I lost my job. You didn't lose anything. When you sacrifice for God, you have the same. When you work for you, you have the same or less. When you give to God, and I'm not talking about money. 
I'm talking about what do you focus on. God promises, put me first and I will go ahead of you. You don't have to fight. I will fight for you. I will go to the war and by the time you get there, the enemy will be dead. You just pick the spoil. Trust me. And for some reason, we don't trust him. And we don't trust him because we don't know him. Because we don't spend time with him to know him. Focus on Bible. Focus on prayer. Focus on kingdom. And trust that he will keep his word. Taste and see. Because this is clear. Jesus is coming soon like a thief. And when he comes, all these things will burn up. Look to your house. You pay mortgage for so many years. Maybe you paid it off. Good for you. It's going to burn up. Yeah. This church is going to burn up. We don't take the church to hell. Church is people. Your car, burn up. Hopefully my motorcycle doesn't, but we'll see. <laughs> I don't have one. When we moved here, Dana made me sell it. He said, in this curves? Uh uh, you cannot have a motorcycle in this curves. You need to ride your car. Uh, you cannot fight your wife. If you want to be happy, you give it up. <laughs> Everything. Education is important, doesn't matter. Job, important, doesn't matter. House, important, doesn't matter. Health, important, doesn't matter. Position, important, doesn't matter. All will go away. One thing matters. Are you going to be there? Because if not, all this stuff, you can impress people, but you cannot impress God. Amen. You can tell yourself or others whatever you want. If you lose heaven, you lost it all. And Jesus says that if you are willing to lose all for heaven, you'll get all. But if you are willing to get all, you lose all in heaven. Because whoever tries to save his life will lose it, and whoever is willing to lose his life will save it. God has no intention to spoil your happiness. God is not going after you to get your house or your job. God wants you to be happy. But you must focus on heaven. Listen, nobody should feel guilty for being rich or having a good job or a big house. Or a nice car. No, there is nothing wrong with it. Abraham was rich. Job was rich. Listen, if you feel bad of having a big house, give it to me. I will feel good. <laughs> Nobody should feel guilty to be well doing, you know, to be rich. But if you focus on it, that's wrong. Because not only rich people, poor people focus on the stuff too. Poor people get stressed over the stuff too. What are you stressed over? What are you obsessed with? What do you lose sleep for? You should lose sleep thinking about ways to serve God, about creative ways to save people, about ways to spend more with God. While you should have a job, lazy people don't have jobs. God asked us, in the same commandment, he said rest. In the same commandment, he said work, six days. Amen. You should have a job. It's good to have a house. But listen, do not focus on it. Don't make it a priority. Don't stress over it. Stress over relationship with God. Stress over service. Stress over heaven. Set your mind. This is what I want. This is what I live for. This is what I fight for. This is what I stress over. This is my sacrifice. This is all. Heaven. That's what I want to get. If I get a house, good. If I don't, good. If I am healthy or sick, I don't care as long as I get heaven. Heaven. If we lose heaven, Jesus is coming soon, folks. We look back, it went so fast. And then we'll say, is it worth? Was it worth it to focus on them? They will burn up, folks. Remember, you got to leave what you say. Unless you, 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 you leave what you believe, then we are fake. Make a list. Make a list and be honest with self. Because you may think, oh, how I love Jesus. That's Bologna. Anybody can sing the song. Pharisees could sing the song so nice. Make a list and put everything there and then be honest and put how much time percentage you spend, how much energy you spend with it, how much time you spend with this, how much time you spend, how much energy, how much money, how much do you invest in it? And then see, I didn't even put heaven or spiritual life or relationship with God. I just left a blank line at the bottom. I'm going to have you write it on your list when you go home. Do that. Re 
really, if you want to know, do that. Go home and then at the bottom put whatever you want. Heaven, relationship with Christ, prayer, study of the word. And then put how much percentage you spend on it. And that's going to tell you your priorities. I am not saying give up jobs, become a pastor. I am saying that wherever you are, if you are in school, if you are in job, if you are home, if you are shopping, wherever you are, whatever you do, heaven should be your priority. Do what you do as you did it for God. At your job, work as you would work for God. The people see you working and they see Christ's character in you. Because that's evangelism 101. Amen. Better than evangelism in the church. When you go to school, do school as you do it for God. So people can see Christ in you. When you go shopping, behave like a Christian. Amen. When you are at the stoplight and somebody gets in front of you, don't do like me. <laughs> ah, I hate bad drivers. They stay, it turns r r green, and they text. Mm, move, is green. And they stay until it goes yellow, and then they leave, and I don't catch the green. Oh. Calm down. Huh? <laughs> Behave as you would do all for Christ. As heaven would be in your mind as the most important goal, the reason for life. Whatever you do, do it in a way that you show that you aim and fight for heaven. I am not saying give up jobs. I am saying do them in a way that you show heaven at your workplace. Do you follow me? Amen. I don't want you to get me wrong. Oh, the pastor said that we should give up everything and just stay on our knees and pray 24-7. I'm not saying that. I am saying to show heaven wherever you go, whatever you do. Invest in heaven. Focus on heaven. Stress on heaven. Dream heaven. Obsess on heaven. If you have an obsession, may heaven be your obsession. Amen. Live for it. Sacrifice for it. Because whatever is your treasure, that's your heart will be. Everything else is going to burn up. Folks, what race are you running? Because you do run a race every day. What are you running for from morning to night? You see, the Bible says, Paul says... Don't you know that those who run in the race, they all run. Don't tell me that you don't run. But only one receives the prize. Run in a way that you get the prize. In 2003, I took Janesville Church from Wisconsin to Romania. We went to a village called Sarmashu. We went there to build a church. We prayed that God would make a difference through us somewhere. And after we prayed, after about a week of prayer, we got a phone call. And somebody told us, you know, they are going to lose everything. I said, who they? The people in Sarmashu. What happened? They started to build a church and they cannot finish it. I said, folks, we have been praying to go somewhere. We got an answer. Let's go. We raised by miracle in a small, small 70, 80 people church. We raised $62,000. And 32 people went in mission trip in Sarmashu. Their church was old and broken. Cracks in the walls that they put cloth to cover the cracks and it was winter so the, the, the cold would not get in the church. And they started the church and they didn't have enough money. And they contingent put their homes as, how do you say it, contingency to get collateral, thank you, oh, English, to get money from the bank to, to finish the building. And they built more, but it was not enough to finish. And they were losing homes and not finish the church. And we came and we built the church and the leftover money, we gave money that you would buy chairs, heating, and fix the parking. And there was leftover. Now listen carefully. Now listen carefully. I went there and it was a Wednesday or a Thursday night. And the head deacon and the head elder with all the elders and all the deacons were in a room praying. And I knocked in the door and they opened the door and they looked to me like, like to some stranger, like a thief or somebody. And they said, please leave. What? We work together from morning to night. My hands are cracked from working in concrete here in the, the whole day and in the night preaching. 
and you're crying. Why do you want me to leave? We cannot tell you, please. We, do, we don't want to tell you, please. I said, I'm not going to leave before you tell me. If you cry, I'm going to cry with you. If you pray, I'm going to pray with you. I'm not going to leave before you tell me why do you cry. Well, we make a covenant. We made a covenant. We don't tell anybody. I'm one with you. Tell me what happened. We put our homes collateral to finish the church and we have two more days and lose our homes. I said, how much do you owe? They had all the math done. This is how much we owe. Folks, listen. Would you believe that that's the leftover money that we had? Amen. We paid the bank. None of them lost homes. And I asked the head elder, why would you do that? He said, well, we knew that these homes will burn and we wanted to finish God's church. Amen. Focus on heaven. Amen. You'll never lose. Within three, four months, because they focus on heaven, they filled the 500 seats new church, and because they didn't have room, they filled the old church again. And they built five more churches around within three years later, because they focus on heaven. When, after we finished the project, we went to Severin. Turno Severin is the city where I was born. And I used to go there with my wife when we were dating. And those ruins are built by Emperor Severus in 103, 103 AD. That's history. The city is built on those ruins. And these are the Roman ruins from 103. Severus and then Trianus. Severus built part of the city and then Trianus built a bridge called, built by Apollodor from Damascus. Apollodor, an architect, built the longest bridge in that time in the whole world and for another 600 years in history was the longest bridge. The Danube River there is about 1,400 meters. That's over 4,500 feet wide. And he built a bridge over the Danube River and the Roman army crossed into Dacia, our country, and took over. And what they did, they brought all the jail people, all the people from prison and colonized there in our city because they wanted to get rid of Christians that were in prisons in Rome. And they brought them there. And they built a city in 103. And when you go through the city, through the ruins, my wife and I would go there and we would pray together and study spirit of... That's the way we were dating in that time. Study the spirit of prophecy together. And I looked through the ruins because it's old memories. And I, as I was walking, guess what I saw? The stadium. Wherever you see a Roman city, you see a stadium. When I went to Israel, guess what I saw by the Mediterranean Sea? A stadium. And if you go back in time and you close your eyes and you try to imagine in that stadium there were in, in, in the seats the emperor and the senators and the soldiers and the rich people and the poor people and inside the stadium there were the young people that they trained all their life to win the crown. They focused all energy, all sacrifice, trained hard from morning to night, 10 hours a day to win the crown. And what did they win? It was leaves. Perishable crown. Three days later, pff, yellow. Well, yes, in our time we get an endorsement from Nike and we get a gold crown. Do you remember, how many of you remember Nadia Comaneci? Yes. Who tells me the year? Uh, now I am testing your memory. Oh, you need to take pills, you are bad. 1976. She was 14 years old. She's the first one in the history of Olympics ever to get all perfect scores, 10.0, all. And she had three gold medals, all 10.0, and then a year later, she got another three, all 10.0, and then two years later, she got another three, all 10.0, and then one year later, she got another one, 10.0. It has never happened before. Well, I looked on the internet to see her in our days, She's old. She's ugly. <laughs> Not really ugly, but... Do you hear people talking about Nadia Comaneci on the streets tomorrow when you go shopping? Nobody remembers her. Because the crown that you run for and get for goes away. Run for the crown that would last. 
focus on the right direction. What do you pray for? Think about it. What do you pray for? Forgive me, save me, bless me, heal me, my job, my family, my, 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 my. My father used to say, I don't even pray for my salvation. And I said, that's wrong. And my father said, no, you are just too selfish to see it. I said, what? And my father would say, if God was broke, listen carefully. If God was broke and he didn't have heaven and didn't have blessings, I would still love him and serve him without any rewards. I am not looking for his rewards or blessings. I just love him. What do we pray for? We, all we pray is for me. Help me, save me, forgive me, give me my job, my school, my kid, my, my, my. Forget you. You are not important. This society is teaching you to focus on you. It's satanic. Focus on God. Amen. Who told you that you should keep your eyes on you? Take your eyes off you. Take your eyes off problems. Take your eyes off sins. Put your eyes on Jesus. Focus on heaven. If not, we are not Christians. Prayer and study. Not for the sake of duty, but to find Jesus. Church, not for the sake of duty, but to find Jesus. Service, not to do a job, but to serve Jesus. Focus on heaven. Focus on heaven. What do you run for? Do you run for the race here or for eternity? Listen to these quotations. Man, this is strong. I saw some who profess to be followers of Christ. They go to church, they do this and that, they go to care meeting and so on. They are ambitious to, but they are ambitious to obtain early things. And they lose their love for heaven. They act like the world. And they are accounted of God as of the world. They profess to be seeking immortal crown. However, their interest in principal study is to acquire early treasures. Those cannot love Jesus. Now, a, a better quotation. That one I don't like much. This one I do like. If you would have the rich treasures of heaven, you must hold secret communion with God. Unless you do this, your soul will be destitute of the Holy Spirit. When you hurry from one thing to another, when you have so much to do that you cannot take time to talk with God, how can you expect power? Mm. Isn't that powerful? Listen, folks, Israel was supposed to get the promised land. They focused on the wilderness and they died in the wilderness. Focus on heaven. Don't lose your focus. You are Adventist. Focus on heaven. Paul says, all these things, all these things are garbage. I don't even care if I live or die, if I have a job or not, if I have a house or not. I don't care. All I care is to see Christ. When I think about the glory, about eternity, I don't care the other things. This, this is something that we Christians must learn. It is one word, one word, one word that we don't know. The word is enough. Christians don't know the word enough. I am content. I am content. I don't need another house. I don't need another car. I don't need more furniture. I don't need more shoes. I don't need this. I don't need, I don't need to stress over I do go to work. I do have a house. But I am not stressed with it. I don't lose sleep over it. All I need is heaven. I can hardly... I focus on heaven. I set my mind on heaven. I go through this because I have to. But my goal, my eyes are focused. Fixed on heaven. And you cannot take that from me. Focus on heaven. Focus on heaven. I remember my father talking to me. I said, well, I want a motorcycle, and I want this, and I want that, and I want a house by the lake. And my father said, and? I said, well, then I'll be happy. And my father said, you know, there is a joke about happiness. I said, okay. Is it a good joke? He said, well, just listen. And he said, somebody, a wise man, told somebody else, if you really want to be happy, this is the secret. You need to get the t-shirt of somebody happy and wear it. When you wear it, you'll be happy. And the guy said, okay. So he went from place to place, from city to city, from county to county, from country to country, looking for somebody happy to buy the t-shirt. And everybody, he asked, nobody was happy. Rich or poor, they were all stressed. 
Finally, he found a man in the land singing, whistling. Are you happy? Yes. Do you have stress? No. Do you have problems? Mm -mm. Do you have peace? Uh huh. Are you really happy? Really happy? Yes. Can I have your t shirt? I'm going to pay anything for it. Hey, man, I don't own a t shirt. I'm sorry. <laughs> do, do you get it? It doesn't depend. My father would say, I said, I didn't get it. I was small and stupid. I didn't get it. And my father said, it doesn't depend on what you have or you don't have. It depends where you keep your eyes. Where do you keep your eyes? Where do you keep your eyes? Because if you keep eyes on Christ, you say, I'm content when I'm in, in plenty and I'm content when I have less. I'm happy because the values that I value are relationship with God. So I don't care. You cannot make me unhappy because the police told my dad, we are going to take everything from you if you don't stop building churches. And my father said, I already gave it to the church. There is nothing to take. I don't care if you take it because I have nothing. They built a church in, in Severin where I was born and they said, how much do we need to finish the church? 25,000. My father said to my mom, honey, how much do you have left over in the house? 25,000. Give it all. Honey, but we need to keep a little. No, honey, tomorrow God is going to bless us again. Give it all. Give it all. I, all I care is that we serve God. I don't care anything else. And this is not about money, folks. I'm not preaching. I could not care less. By God's grace, we are okay. I'm talking about relationship. I am talking about priorities. Amen. That's what I am talking about. The Bible is very plain. Don't worry about life. We are what you eat, what you drink, what you drive. Da, 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 da. You are more important than barns, than birds, than grass. You are more important. The problem is faith. Because God says, seek first the kingdom of God and the other things will be given to you. So it's a matter of faith. If you seek God first, you need to trust that he will take care of you. Every time I had a classmate, he was an Adventist too. We were both in the army. He chose to work on Sabbath, I chose not to work on Sabbath. They didn't put, me, didn't put him in prison. They did threaten me with prison for 14 years. They never did put me in prison. We were in college together in construction university. He went to school on Sabbath, I didn't. He didn't get two degrees. He still got one, I still got one. And he would say to me, he would say to me, I am afraid they will, like, they will expel me from the school. I said, it's a matter of faith. Put God first. We had exams. He didn't go to church. He didn't go to evangelism because he had to focus on learning. I did learn. Don't get me wrong. You don't just, hey, I go to the church so I don't have to learn so God is going to bless me with an A. You don't have a brain if you think that way. There is something wrong with you. I did learn. But when time came for church or for study, I dropped everything because study and prayer came first. When we got to the exam, I got an A, he got a B. I said, how, how in the world you got an A? I said, well, I don't know. You need to pray the way I pray. <laughs> Folks, focus on heaven. You know the song? God will take care of you. You need to trust in him. He has been taking care of Elijah, Israel. He will carry you in his palms. He will have his angels protect you. Water and bread and maybe juice and cake will be provided. Angry and beans. My father and his best friend, Benjamin, they were giving books, Bibles and Spirit of Prophecy, and uh, the police came and beat them and asked them to stop spreading religious literature. So what they did, they said, we cannot stop. We got to do God's work. So what they did, they ran and hid in the forest, and the police was looking for them. And when you get out of that town, there are two mountains, and deep, deep gorge, and the water going down through the gorge, and there is a concrete bridge over the gorge, and the police was by the bridge to catch them when they go and confiscate their books and beat them again. And my father saw the police from far away and said to his friend, let's go in the forest and hide until they leave. Well, 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 they stayed three days and three nights hiding, and the police was taking turns and waiting there. 
So they said, we must do something about it. So what they did, they found an old rotten wood bridge. And they went on that bridge to cross the gorge and leave the town. Well, they were walking on the bridge. And my father was singing, I'm a son of the king. I'm a son of the king, of the king, of the king. And the song says, and I'm afraid of anything. Nothing. I'm not. I serve the Lord and I'm not afraid because I'm a son of the king and I keep my eyes on the king and I trust the king. And as he was singing and crossing the wood bridge, Benjamin from behind my father said, Pavel, watch where you walk. And my father said, what? Look down. And my father looks down and there were six boards missing. And the deep, 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 deep gorge, way down. And his foot was in the air. And he, oops, put the other foot on the wood. And he looked. And Benjamin had to jump to manage the opening, the span, to jump over. And he said, you took two steps on the air. And my father said, I told you he will take care of me. <laughs> I told you he will send his angels. Folks, nobody loses by putting God first. Nobody loses. In fact, God says, put me first, and I will go before you, and I will fight for you, and I will give you homes that you didn't build, and that in quietness and tranquility will be your salvation. I'm going to give you bread like in sleep because I love you. Trust, faith, priorities, peace, tranquility. But by the way, as we come close to the finish, by the way, Everything you do requires sacrifice. When you are in school, if you really want to do well, you sacrifice. When you are in job, if you really want to do well, you sacrifice. You put your, you throw yourself into it. In family, more than any other place, if you want to do well in your marriage, you sacrifice. Because if you don't sacrifice, it's going to be a lot of sparks there. A lot of fire. Explosions. You know, you, you, you got to choose. You want to be happy or you want to be right. You cannot have both. So it takes sacrifice if you really want to have a family. It takes sacrifice when you have children. Trust me, a lot of sacrifice. Those who have children, they know. <clears throat> it takes sacrifice. Do you think that it doesn't take sacrifice to serve God? Oh, don't let anybody to tell you that it's going to be easy. It takes sacrifice. The point is, you got to choose what you sacrifice for. <clears throat> If we sacrifice for our jobs, for our homes, for our families, from morning to night, why not for heaven? Amen. What are you sacrificing for? Is it worthy? I consider that all things are not worthy to be compared with heaven. I count them all a loss. <clears throat> By the way, Jesus says, whoever wants to follow me, and doesn't give up the other things, cannot be my disciple. Paul sacrificed so much. We may think to come through the rain from the parking to the church is sacrifice. That's no sacrifice. Give me a break. Oh, somebody took my seat. That's affliction. It's not affliction if somebody took your seat in the church. Give me a break. And you may have some real challenges. Health, family, I don't know. But listen, folks. Paul had more than anybody else. And yet, this is what he says. Our momentary troubles are achieving eternal glory. They don't happen by chance. God allowed them because nothing happens by chance. All things work together. God allowed them to teach you patience, to teach you humbleness, to teach you sacrifice, to teach you prioritize, to teach you faith, whatever. Don't complain. Don't focus on them. Rather, instead of fixing your eyes on problems and pain, fix your eyes on the things you don't see. Because these things are temporary. Paul says, and I will not read the verses, you know them. I was in prison, I was flagged, I was stoned, I was in, in the sea, I was a danger, I was... Ta -ta 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 -ta. But <clears throat> my concern is for the church. Isn't that something? He is beaten, he is persecuted, and he says, my concern is not for me. My concern is for God's work. Focus on heaven. Because, folks, regardless if Jesus comes or you die, there is something right there in the middle, <clears throat> a hyphen. And the way you spend that short, quick, passing hyphen, 
that's life, is going to determine your eternity. Therefore, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, who himself ignored the cross and everything and fixed his eyes on God. Because our light affliction, that is only for a moment, is working for us. Far more, and here I did something childish. I took the Greek word and all the possible translations and I put them all because I just love them all and I could not give up one. I put them all there for you. It says there, is working for us far more exceedingly, utterly, greatly, incomparable, beyond all comparison, an eternal weight of glory. Eternal! Amen. Think about it. Think for, imagine. Close your eyes and imagine. Soon Jesus comes. You are going to see him you are going to lock eyes with him. You are going to drop down by his feet, hug him. And in that moment, you'll say, man, I sacrificed so much to be here. I don't know if it was worth. Are you going to say that? No. Are you crazy? You'll say, it was worth. It was nothing. Oh, it was nothing. This is unbelievable. Thank you. Fix your eyes on the second coming. This is our God. We have been waiting for him. He will save us. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Folks, God is calling you and me, Lexington Church, and all people that are listening, to make a shift in your life. That means that from now, from this moment, you shift your focus. And instead of allowing yourself to worry for this life, while you do what you have to do, you fix your eyes on relationship with God, relationship with people, service, second coming. And you do it in faith that God will take care of you. And you say, Lord, I'm not able, but I'm going to count on you. And this is what I do. I surrender everything. I surrender my life. I surrender my job. I surrender my family. Education, health, Salvation, give it all up. Because if you keep it, you will lose it. Amen. 